Greetings everyone, this is David Arhan and today's video is going to be about Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 to 12 which will specifically cover the Beatitudes in Christ's Sermon on the Mount and the rest of the sermon will be covered in future videos. The specific focus on this video will not be the bare basic reading. Most of you, if not all of you, are quite intelligent enough to understand the bare reading of certain Beatitudes such as how God is with us when we're grieving or how uh, it is good to be a peacemaker. What I will be doing instead is I will be providing you with St. Gregor of Nyssa's in-depth commentary in his homilies on the Beatitudes so that we can understand the deeper meanings of the Beatitudes. And before I move on with this presentation, I would like to just state that make sure to like this video, subscribe and share. And if you want to financially support me via Patreon, you can do so by the link in the description below. So now let's move on with the Sermon on the Mount, right? The Beatitudes are a part of Christ's Sermon on the Mount. The key point of his sermon, of his overall sermon, is that the teachings of the Old Testament are oriented, and I'm talking about the moral teachings in this case, are oriented towards the person of Christ. Moreover, and this is very key, Christ speaks with authority, showing that he has authority over the teachings of the Old Testament. And since God himself is the author of the covenant between God and man, and he is the one who has authority over it, this means that Christ is God. So this is one of the examples that we could used to demonstrate that Christ is divine. One key statement of this sermon is that we shall be perfect as the Father is perfect. This is relevant to the ethics of virtue in Orthodox Christianity because what Christ is saying isn't that we can do externally perfect acts of the Father without blemish, but rather that we can acquire the divine virtues of the Father by having Him work in us through His Son and in His Spirit. And this gets us to the Beatitudes and the meaning of the Beatitudes and what they're about. St. Gregor of Nyssa says, the goal of the virtuous life is likeness to the divinity. And this is a key concept in Orthodox Christianity, right? Having the likeness of God. Man does this by the means of synergy, that is, by having God work in him and participate in his divinity by reacquiring the likeness that man has to God, which was lost after the fall. And St. Gregor of Nyssa, moreover, says, so to participate in the Beatitudes is nothing less than sharing in deity towards which the Lord leads us up by his words. Key detail here to understand is that it's important to point out that Christianity does not follow consequentialist or deontological ethics, but virtue ethics. And the virtues which are sourced in God are participated by human beings through Christ. So for instance, almsgiving isn't good just for the sake of the action itself, otherwise someone with a selfish motivation will do just as much good as one with the proper motivation disposition, but it is good with the correct disposition, because as an action, it's a disposition God himself has by nature and that we acquire the likeness of. And this is, for, for instance, what makes almsgiving a good act, right? We're supposed to have the correct disposition in doing this act. This is something key to understand as we get to the rest of the Beatitudes. So the first Beatitudes that we can talk about is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the starting point of the virtues is humility. And this is important because once man becomes humble and understands that he cannot acquire the virtues and he can't be a virtuous person by himself, this is how man starts to learn, right? The, the first part of learning is to understand, that is to be humble, that you don't know what you're supposed to learn in the first place, right? If you think that you know, right, what you're trying to learn, what you're trying to acquire, then you're never going to be able to learn, you're never going to be able to acquire what you're trying to learn at the end of the day, right? So it's a recognition of our weakness and inferiority and also a recognition of the desire that we have to adopt the virtues of God. And in this case, to be the perfect as the Father is perfect, right? And the wealth we shall seek after are the divine virtues because they are bound with the soul and are incorrupt. And so earthly pleasures, right, that we at times care about, these are things that will decay and fade away, right? And when we die, they're not going to go to the, to the next world with us, right? What is going to stick it's going to be the divine virtues, right? It's going to be the virtues that will be embedded in our soul that we acquire through likeness in God. And that is what's going to keep us safe in the afterlife. So it's very key to understand this, to have an actual proper good Christian life. So one should be poor in earthly desires. And it's I want to point out that this doesn't mean that every Christian should be a poor person, right? Rather, that our disposition towards earthly desires should be of a poor, poor in spirit, of, of someone who's poor in spirit. This is what it means. 
Another sense of being poor in spirit is voluntary humility. And we can see that Christ himself does this, right? As is, it's demonstrated in 2 Corinthians 8, verses 8 and 9. Because Christ became, Christ is humble. Christ being humble emptied himself for the sake of our salvation, right? And we shall imitate Christ in his humility, who being God emptied himself and became lower than the angels in, because human beings are lower than the angels. So he didn't become lower than the angels in his divine nature. Rather, he became lower than the angels by uniting himself with, with human nature. Moreover, the folly of pursuing earthly gifts or spiritual ones is immense, right? It's a big mistake to do this because the spiritual life is eternal and incorrupt by nature and by grace. Whereas the earthly life, as I said, passes away and decays. And the basic point here is that we will all die one day and we should work for the things that we can keep when we die. And those who give up their earthly possession to follow Christ are those who are called poor in spirit that are blessed. Thus, this is a vindication also of the monastic life. Because what is the monastic life? Well, the monastic life is the renunciation of, the, of earthly cares and truly becoming poor in spirit, right? And so the monastic life is blessed for this reason. <clears throat> and Christ says in spirit, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit to signify that he's blessing those who are poor, not by necessity, but by voluntary means. And in here... Clement of Alexandria uh, quotes Plato saying, it is not the diminishing of one's resources, but the augmenting of insatiableness that is to be considered poverty. For it is not slender means that ever constitutes poverty, but insatiableness from which the good man being free will also be rich. So what does this mean? Well, this is related to virtue ethics as well, right? Um, being poor in and of itself is not good. It's not bad either, right? What's important is having the correct disposition. So Christ is telling us that we must have the correct disposition towards earthly things and understand it decays over time, that it's not going to be bound with us when we die. So it's all going to pass away. And so even a rich person, right, at the end of the day, a rich person can have the proper disposition of one that's poor in spirit, right? <clears throat> and he might be rich not because he desires to be rich or anything like that, but for genuinely good reasons, right? And how this relates to uh, the popular verse about, you know, a uh, rich man not being able to enter heaven, that will come in a different video as well, right? So the next beatitude is, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. So again, I want to point out a very key detail, is that grieving or mourning in and of itself is not necessarily good or bad, right? It's the correct disposition. And so not everyone that is grieving is going to be comforted in a sense. So some people might be might grieve over bad reasons. Some people might grieve because, for instance, uh, due to their pride, right, it might help them feel better of them, better of themselves in some sick psychological way. You know, many people that have this kind of thinking. So the people that will be comforted, right, and and the mourning. Well, the grieving is over sins, right, and having sorrow and desiring to repent. And also, sorrow is a state of losing something valuable, right? And why do you, you know, why do you mourn when you lose something valuable? And the most valuable thing here is really um, the likeness of God that is proper to us in our souls, right? And, and the loss of the innocent and the good life. And they will be comforted because they desire to repent of this, right? And they will be comforted not in some vague emotive sense of, you know, feeling good of them, good about themselves, but they will be comforted with eternal life and participation in the goodness of God because those people have let, lost that life, right? They're mourning the loss of that life due to original sin. <clears throat> and the source of mourning is knowing that the source of the good and blessed life is not all in this life, right? The fall into sin is a fall from blessedness to a state of losing that blessedness. And this is what man is mourning, as I said, because man has lost this innocent state. And Clement of Alexandria says, the mourners are those who mourn after, and I'm paraphrasing here, the mourners are those who mourn after those who have died unrepentant. Those who mourn, however, are repentant of their own sins and shall be comforted with the calling to follow God and be saved. Next beatitude is, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is a popular one. A lot of people really misunderstand this. So again, St. Gregory of Nyssa, and, and the popular misunderstanding here, before I move on, is that, oh, this is just telling you to be weak, right? This is just telling you to just take it, right? Everything bad that bad that happens to you, just take it and, you know, be a weak person. Just let people do bad things to you. Uh, this is not what this verse is saying, 
Okay, if you have this understanding and if you think this is a good thing to do, no, you're doing something evil. Okay, that's not what being meek means. Saint Gregory of Nyssa, in fact, explains what it means. So here we have a fourth century, very important church father, right? Historical church father explaining to us that we shouldn't be meek in all senses, but rather the meekness here refers to self-control and control over our passions, right? So if someone, in, in a popular example, right? If someone is disrespecting you, the correct reaction isn't to just lash out uncontrollably, but to stand your ground while possessing control over your own self and co control over your passions, right? You can still stand up for yourself. This is still something that St. Gregory of Nyssa himself talks about this being a good thing. And St. Gregory of Nyssa says, Blessed then are those who are not quickly tilted towards the passionate steerings of the soul, but who are controlled by the mind, and in whom reason, like a bit restraining the impulses, does not let the soul be swept off into disorder, right? So, Having control over your soul and over your emotions, this is what it's, this verse is saying, right? And they will inherit the earth, right? Because they will be inheriting the kingdom of heaven by the flesh of Christ, right? So we will be inheriting, you know, God's heavenly kingdom, basically, as the sons of God. Um, so this is what this is referring to. If you control our passions. And the land here is a land of the garden of which the father is the vine dresser, and we eat of its fruits, that is, we participate in the divine energies or the activities of God. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So combine this with John 7.37, which says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Right? For one to hunger and thirst after righteousness, one must hunger and thirst after Christ. And how do we hunger and thirst after Christ? And in a proper way, well, we consume the Eucharist, right? And so the soul, which hungers for many things, uh, must be oriented in hungering after God, who is the source of all goodness. So you have all of these, you have religions like Islam, for example, that promise you that when you die, you're going to have these lustful, you know, vine drinking, uh, S3X parties with these spiritual beings. And a, a big mistake in that kind of thinking is that you're not really focusing on the source of goodness itself, right? You're, you're being distracted by the pleasures of the world and you think that you're going to have them in heaven, but you're not going to have any of these things. You're going to have the very source of goodness in life itself. And that's what God will give to you, right? So this is much better, much more important than, again, having S3X with... Uh, huris and, and nonsense like this. So this is a big difference between the Christian view of the afterlife and the Christian view of salvation and the, sal the salvific view of, for example, Islam in this case, but even other religions too, which have a very earthly view in general. Ultimately, the virtues are centered around Christ. And for this reason, we hunger after the Lord and his eternal life. And again, this is one of the big points of the Eucharist. And the spiritual food Christ hungered and thirsted after himself, right? And so we thirst after Christ, like, Christ hungered and thirsted after doing the will of the Father, right, in his humanity. And this is the righteous that we, righteousness that we must hunger after as well in order to be blessed. And the will of the Father is, according to 1 Timothy 2, 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So possessing truth and to be saved, right, and to live in accordance with the will of the Father. The virtue of righteousness implies all the other virtues in the same way uh, as, you know, one of the energies of God that is, in this case, you know, him being Lord, right? Implies other energies, right? So if you're talking about a Lord, a divine being, we're also talking about a divine being being omnipotent, omniscient, etc. So the virtue of righteousness implies all of the other virtues that is talked about in this video and not talked about in this verse, so being just, being wise, right? All of this is presupposed you know, they, they presuppose each other, and they also presuppose righteousness. And St. Gregory of Nyssa uh, cites Proverbs 23, 27, which says that, uh, saying that the desire for earthly things is a leaky jar, right? That constantly wants to be filled more, but cannot, cannot ever be filled, right? We want something earthly, and we just try to have it, try to have it more and more and more, but we, can, we just can't stop desiring it, right? Whereas the desire for spiritual things, like the virtues of God, are... Indefinite and last 
until you know last eternity due to their spiritual character as i previously discussed right so for example when one seeks temperance he is not renouncing things like food but the inappropriate excess of it right and so this kind of a disposition towards earthly things which presupposes other again ver different virtues right if you are temperate then we have basically renounced our desire for earthly things in the form of food for instance right this is why temperance is important but this is why gluttony is one of the cardinal sins that we should be avoiding next is blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy and, and a key point i want to make here is that not just mercy but all of the virtues that i'm talking about here in this video and saint Gregorius is talking about and christ himself is talking about they themselves are the reward right so we shouldn't be thinking of these things as as if oh i'm going to do this and i'm going to get an earthly reward and i'm going to feel happy and good right that's not the point the point is that having these correct virtues and dispositions themselves are a reward, right? And it's what allows us and enables us to have eternal life in Christ and eternal life with God. And so mercy, in this case, is a very natural virtue of God. And those who are merciful themselves to other people uh, partake in God's mercy and attain likeness to God, right? So this is a clear example of this. And the merciful identifies himself with those whom experience evil and grievous events, right? And this, for this reason, mercy is the father of goodwill. And St. Gregor of Nyssa says, Mercy, if we are to explain it with a definition, is voluntary misery caused by other people's ills. So we can understand that the obvious meaning, uh, as I talked about this before, the obvious meaning is this, we will obtain mercy when we are merciful. But the deeper meaning is that being merciful is a reward in and of itself. And the judgment given by Christ is also the judgment man will give himself if he lacks any of the virtues, right? So this is the contrary position, right? If you are merciful, you will obtain mercy. And if you're not merciful, then you will not obtain mercy because you yourself had denied mercy, right? And so the judgment is also synergistic in a sense. And man himself, right? If man is condemned, man condemns himself as well uh, by his own word, by his own actions, by his own disposition, by his own character, right? The parable of the talents is used for the virtues, so if we hide our virtues from others uh, or and, of our, and from ourselves, those virtues will not be able to you know, plant any seeds and grow anything, right? And it won't be for, for any benefit. As St. Maximus the Confessor says, virtues are natural to human beings, right? They're not introduced from outside. They're natural to us because they're communicated to us by God. But if we don't practice them and we practice the virtues by asceticism, if we don't do this, then we will not be saved because we ourselves end up rejecting salvation by denying the virtues of God and the practice of the virtues. And it's key to understand being merciful is not about, you know, being vaguely nice. It's about carrying the burden of sins of others that is true mercy. So this is very key. A lot of people think being merciful is just being nice to people. But true mercy is very different than that. The next one is blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Now this, there's a lot of things St. Gregory of Nyssa says. It's very key about this uh, beatitude first of all we must understand that no man can see god right no man can see god in his nature and this is <laughs> explained very clearly in scripture but saint gregory of nyssa points out in scripture seeing something in the case seeing god is synonymous with possessing that thing right so in psalm he uses the example of psalm 128 5 the Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. And also Isaiah 26, 10. Let favor be shewed to the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly, and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. St. Gregory of Nyssa is saying that, you know, in one of the understandings of this beatitude is that those who are pure in heart will possess God. That is, be saved by God, right? And possess the divine life in himself, right? Um, not in himself in the same way Christ by nature, but by grace, right? By the grace of God. This is a key detail that I want to point out. Another thing is that man cannot see or possess God because man is impure and God's presence is purity and goodness itself. And, you know, sin, right? Sin is like darkness and God is like light. And what happens when light enters into a dark room? Darkness vanishes. And so with this analogy, we can understand that if, the reason why God doesn't show himself as clearly as a lot of people like for him to, right? So this is one of the popular arguments against God. It's like, you know, if God exists, why can't I see him? Well, it's because you're impure. Not, you're not impure just because 
you know, you're an evil person or anything like that. It's because of original sin, because you are not ready to have that experience to see God, to possess God. And if that were to happen, if you were to come into contact, you will be annihilated. It, not annihilated in the sense of, sense of, you know, your body and soul will be destroyed, but annihilated in the sense of you will die, right? And this has happened in Scripture many, many times in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And so in order to see God and to possess God, one must cleanse himself from sins and partake of God's good things in order to be purified and repent. And moreover, thoughts come from the heart, as it is stated in Matthew 15, 19. As such, the mind where thoughts originate from must be purified from sins to be able to be illuminated to see God. And when the mind is unmixed with evil and purifies itself from earthly passions, the kingdom of God enters the man and man sees God, that is, possesses God's divine character and virtues, right? So this is what seeing God means. And being pure in heart, again, and as, as, as I stated previously, is a reward in and of itself. St. Gregory of Nyssa says, To be sure, Scripture has decreed the sublime life to be not totally unattainable, in that it has told the marvels of such great men in the sacred books. Since, however, the promise of seeing God has a twofold meaning, either that of understanding the nature which transcends the universe, or that of being united with Him through the purity of life, the former kind of apprehension is declared by the voice of the saints to, to be unattainable, Whereas the latter is promised to the human race through the present teaching of the Lord when he says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So what does he mean here? He's basically saying that we will not be seeing God in his essence, but rather by acquiring the likeness of God, we will possess God's divine char characteristics in a sense, right? True grace. But another key point that St. Gregory of Nyssa uh, makes is that St. Gregory explains a different meaning of this verse by saying that that God's essence is not visible, right? But what's visible about God is his divine energies. And a specific quote that I want to read from this, from, this, from this page is, He who is by nature invisible becomes visible in his operations, that is, energies, right? Being seen in certain cases by the properties he possesses, right? So we see a very clear example of essence energy distinction in St. Gregory of Nyssa and even in this Bible verse as well. Having said that, I want to continue. Uh, Christ doesn't just eliminate open wrongdoing like the Old Testament did, but he goes after the virtues and vices in the heart of man and cleanses man from his vices to heal him, right? And uh, there's this similarity between this, this approach and Aristotle's approach, right? Where, for example, and St. Gregory of Nyssa himself makes this point, uh, anger, for example, um, anger isn't always bad. Rather, the incorrect application of this is what's bad. St. Gregory of Nyssa says, Whereas in almost all life, the disease of anger is an immediate threat, he begins with the cure for the most pressing disease, stipulating in the first place no anger. You have learned, he says, from the earlier law not to murder. Now learn to rid the soul of anger against your fellow humans. He did not forbid anger altogether, for it is sometimes possible to use this impulse of the soul for a good end, such as being angry against sin. But adopting an angry attitude to one's brother at any time for no good reason, that is what he suppresses by his commandment. Everyone who is angry with his brother, he says, without a cause. The addition of without a cause shows that often the use of wrath is timely when the passion for sin to be punished blows up, right? And the opposition to God in life is the demonic life, and you're either with God, that is, you will with God and allow him to energize in you and work in you, or you energize with the demons and be evil in your choices, that is, you participate in the demonic life, right? So you either participate in divine life or you participate in the demonic life. And this is what asceticism does, is that it allows us to participate in the divine life, right? Uh, to, to move from being children of evil to children of God. The next beatitude is, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So this is about being the sons of God by adoption. Christ himself is the son of God by nature. This is a point that I made in, in my commentary on Matthew 1, right? Uh, Christ is the son of God by nature. And by being baptized, we become sons of God by adoption, by grace. And a key point about being a peacemaker is a presupposition of this is you have to have peace in yourself first. Uh, peace stands against all instruments of evil that tries to divide man from God. But being a peacemaker is also about making peace between, not just between men and other men, but also between men and God, right? Because Christ himself is the ultimate peacemaker because he mediates between God and man, as St. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2.5. 
And so we must follow his example by, by making peace between God and man, right? And so when we see our fellow brother, for example, sin, we are to correct him and to push him to the correct path, for example. This is what it means to be a peacemaker. St. Gregory of Nyssa says, Blessed then are the peacemakers, for they should be called sons of God. Who are they? The imitators of the divine love of people, those who share in their own lives what belongs to the activity that is energy of God. And the peacemaker partakes of the energies of the Spirit, which is listed in Galatians 5, 22 23 the next beatitude is blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven a very key point about this is this is about being persecuted for righteousness sake so those who are persecuted for the sake of christ those will inherit the kingdom of heaven this is why we have many martyrs right many people who were persecuted just for being an orthodox christian who are martyrs and are partaking of christ's life in heaven right those are martyrs but this is also why um, we don't say that those who are outside of the church who are persecuted are necessarily good people. We're not saying they're necessarily evil people either. But the key point here is being persecuted for righteousness sake. And this is a very key point. Moreover, this is the eighth, be eighth beatitude. And this refers to the eighth day in which we are all resurrected, right? And those who are persecuted for righteousness sake will be resurrected in the kingdom of heaven, re reacquiring the bodies that they've lost due to death. And this shows us that martyrdom is ultimately a victory. Because one is a martyr due to being persecuted by the forces that are against Christ, that is against evil. And those estranged from evil are good, right? So if evil is persecuting you and desire to kill you, well, that means, makes it clear that which side you are on in this case, right? Um, because evil does not persecute its, its own, right? In an ultimate sense. And so martyrdom is worth it because although human beings desire pleasure and want the pleasures of the earthly life, the source of those pleasures, again, is in the heavenly life. And the continuation of the eighth beatitude, which is told to the apostles, because this is what they will be experiencing, is, Blessed are ye, when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you, right? So just like the prophets who were persecuted for the truth, Christians also will be persecuted for the truth. And if you, if you know about the 2000 year history of the Orthodox Church, and really even before the 2000 years, right? Before the incarnation in the Old Testament prophets and so on and so forth, we know for certain that this is the case and this is the true words of Christ, that people will be persecuted just for following Christ, just for being part of the Orthodox Church, just for confessing Christ. We saw this in the early persecutions of the Romans against Christians and what happened afterwards is the Romans themselves became Christian. We saw this in very recently in the communist revolution, which for many years have murdered millions of Orthodox Christians. Orthodox Christianity stands to this day in Russia, but look at where communism is. It doesn't exist pretty much anywhere. And even the so-called communist states are anything but communist. If you look at it from a different perspective, I will say at the very least. Um, and another key point that I want to make is that those who exalt when their reputation is tarnished are not those who will be parting of the eternal life because they are, again, they're happy for earthly reasons, right? Because they think that, oh, you know, I'm, I'm being persecuted or, you know, bad things are happening to me. That must mean I'm a good person, right? That's not what we're supposed to think. Uh, it's the opposite of what we're supposed to do. So condemnations are included to those who celebrate being persecuted to further their fame and recognition. So there's unfortunately people like that as well. This is not the kind of a person that we should be. So that's another key point that I want to make. And this pretty much uh, covers everything I wanted to cover in this video. I would like to end this video with a special thank you for you to wa for watching this, but also for the Patreon financiers. Uh, thank you to Abraham. Thank you to Carl, Dayan, Marco, Theodore, Vander, Sean, Larry, Andy, Peyton, GigaChat, Quinn, Sean, Brian, Marco, Dark Solite, Eddie, Node, Maximus, Mitch, Vlad, Kerry, Nectarius, and Norbert. Thank you all for supporting me financially. Thank you for watching this video. If you like this, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And I will see all of you in the next video. Thanks for watching and may God be with you all. Goodbye.